Welcome everybody, this is incredibly exciting. Thanks for coming on such a beautiful evening, thank you for taking the time. Uh, my name's Maeve, I'm Project Officer at The Social Guarantee. Um, I'm absolutely over the moon to be chairing this event um, with such an amazing panel. Um, I'm also just absolutely over the moon to be launching The Social Guarantee at all. It's been a lot of work has gone into this and yeah, this is a really exciting moment for everyone involved and um, yeah, hope you hope you enjoy it. So. Really excited about the panel we've got, but I'm afraid, first of all, you're going to have to hear from me. Um, so I'm just going to set the scene to talk a bit about what the social guarantee actually is. So what the concept is and what we are as an organisation and what we're trying to achieve. So um, as you can see, I've got a PowerPoint and everything. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through it and then and then move on to the panel. OK, so. The first thing to say about the social guarantee is that it's all about meeting people's needs. So first and foremost, we're starting with what people need. So there's been tons of work done over many decades by uh, people like Amartya Sen, Martha Nussbaum, Ian Goff, people like that. Um, and we know exactly what people need to be able to participate in society. We know what things people need to have access to, to enable them to live freely, to be able to communicate with others, to enable their bodies to keep functioning. So these aren't like subjective wants. These are objective needs that apply to all people universally. So because everybody needs to have these things to live a good life and because many, many people don't have these things, um, this is where the social guarantee starts. This is the essence of what it is. So example of needs include uh, food. Obviously, we need food. We need um, nutritious food for a healthy body. Um, next one is the internet. So in Britain in 2021, it's become um, ever clearer, particularly during the pandemic, that it's impossible to gain the education and the information and the income required to function in society without access to reliable internet. So the internet is one. And we have transport. So we obviously need to be able to get to jobs. We need to be able to get to doctor's appointments, social occasions, and so on. And um, housing, we need to secure shelter. Um, and obviously that means housing, but it also means the utilities like water and energy within that housing. Um, we need childcare, obviously children, well, adult social care first, because that's the one that's come up. Um, yeah, people, vulnerable people need support and need to, need, um, to, yeah, to be supported. We've got childcare, which is obviously children can't look after themselves, so they need looking after. Um, and obviously we've got healthcare and education. Um, and it's not on this slide, but it really is important to say that none of these needs can be met in a planet that's burning. So staying within our planetary boundaries is absolutely essential to the social guarantee as well. And next slide, please, Paul. Thank you. So yeah, it's fair to say that you can't always buy what you need. So some of these things like healthcare and education, for example, are incredibly expensive and not accessible to purchase privately unless you're very rich. And this doesn't make them any less essential for living a fulfilling life. So for these things, um, the collective provision of these services is necessary to ensure that everyone can have access to them regardless of price. That said, some of these things uh, like food, for example, are much more based on individual preferences and the collection, collective provision of these uh, would not be appropriate. So we're not talking about sending food boxes to everybody's house. Um, that wouldn't make any sense. So. These things are on a rough spectrum, so you can see it there. And this is, as I say, this is rough. We're open to people contributing and getting in touch with us about these sorts of things. But yeah, it ranges from things that make sense for people to get for themselves to things that are prohibitively expensive, so have to be provided collectively. Um, and as it makes sense for some of these essential services to be purchased by individuals, it's really important, therefore, that absolutely everyone has the money to do this. So yeah, this is what we mean by the social guarantee. And uh, I really want to thank our colleagues at NEF, Clifford and Sarah for their support and, and Anna, my colleague at the social guarantee for, for support with this diagram. So yeah, the social guarantee is universal services for those things that should be collectively provided. And it's a living income for those services that it makes sense for individuals to buy themselves. So it's really important here to make the distinction between a living income and UBI. So what we're advocating for is a minimum income guarantee or an income floor that no one can fall below. Um, and this floor can be met through employment, so employment with a real living wage, or for those unable to work, it can be met through cash benefits. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, as I say, um, there's a varied nature to what these essentials, these lives essentials are. And so because they vary so much, the ways in which we need to meet them um, will also vary. So needs can be met in different ways by different types of organizations. So we can 
we've got local businesses, cooperatives, community initiatives, but also local authorities and also directly by the state where appropriate. So regardless of these different approaches to, to delivering these needs, certain, certain principles must apply. So first off, yeah, access to life's essentials. Everybody needs to have access to these. They must be universal. Secondly, um, access is based on need rather than ability to pay. So no one should be denied a, denied a secure house, for example, just because they're poor. And um, next is, so power must be devolved to the lowest appropriate level. And what that means is increased economic democracy and enabling communities and service users to shape the services that they receive. Um, services need to be delivered by a diverse range of different providers, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there also needs to be meaningful participation of end users in the design of these services. Though, of course, technical expertise is also, is also required. Um, service providers must have good employment practices and play a real living wage. Um, I think I'm, I need another, but thank you. And another bullet point, thanks, Paul. And yeah. As I said before, everybody must have access to these essentials. So this must be enforceable. So there can't be any holes in provision. And where there is holes in provision, it's essential that action is taken to, to fill up these holes. And then lastly, it really needs to be hammered home as much as possible that we cannot meet people's needs without ensuring that we stay within planetary boundaries. So yes, the benefits of the social guarantee, which, which are many and great. So the first one is equality. So the collective provision of essential services is incredibly redistributive. So the delivery of high quality public services is, is a social wage. And what we mean by that is that without these services, low income people would have to pay a huge percentage of their income on meeting these needs. And so that means that providing them free at the point of use or at a genuinely affordable price will benefit those on low incomes disproportionately. So when we include a minimum income guarantee with this, universal services can really go a long way towards eradicating poverty. Next is sustainability. So yeah, the social guarantee is the bedrock of a sustainable economy. When we make the role of the economy to be fulfilling essential needs rather than ever never ending growth, staying within planetary boundaries becomes an essential aspect of all economic activity. Um, I'm not gonna go on about this because I know our pan panelists will have a lot more interesting things to say. So yeah, next is efficiency. It's cheaper and more efficient to provide things like healthcare publicly. We, we absolutely know this. Um, extracting profit by its definition costs money. And um, so publicly provided services are able to collaborate rather than compete and are able to share things like administrative and research functions. And then lastly, we've got solidarity. So the social guarantee is about ensuring that everybody has their needs met through the collective provision of public services, right? This is a guarantee that we as a society will not let anyone fall below that line. So it's not about a safety net that we can put holes into. It's rather, it's about laying solid foundations together upon which we can all build fulfilling lives. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the last sort of bit on the, on the substantive content of the social guarantee, but it's really important to say um, about the role of the state, and it does play an important role in all of this. First and foremost, it's a direct provider of services where, where appropriate, um, but also, yeah, it needs to guarantee equality of access. So where there are holes in the provision of services, it is up to the state to step in and enable these holes to be filled, either through funding local organisations to do so, or by filling the holes directly where appropriate. Next, the state must set and enforce standards on employment, on quality, on ethics, and on sustainability. The state must also collect funds through taxation and then distribute them in an equitable way. And lastly, the state can act as a medium through which different region, regions and industries can communicate um, and support and enable good practice. To sum up, and I'll have all the text on this, thank you. Yeah, so the social guarantee enshrines universal services so that everyone has access to life's essentials according to need. And the reason we want the social guarantee is because we believe that this is this is how we're going to create a society in which people can flourish and feel secure. So that's it, right? That's what we mean by the social guarantee, the concept. Um, and very quickly, I just want to say what social guarantee the organisation is, is, is doing. So next slide, please. So yeah, our strategic goals are firstly to get it on the agenda through events like this, through blogs, through articles, through collaborations and the rest of it. Secondly, um, to create alliances and networks. So we're really, really keen for anyone that likes this concept to use it. 
is purposefully malleable, it's broad reaching, and it fits perfectly with concepts like the Green New Deal, with the donor, with community wealth building and others. We really wanna build on these similarities and develop these concepts, concepts with others. And then lastly, um, we'll continue to produce research and publications fleshing out exactly what these ideas mean in practice. And that is it from me. So now you get to, yeah, listen to our fabulous panelists. So the first person that's gonna speak, and it's my absolute honor to um, introduce is Anne Pettifer. So she is, I'm sh yeah, an, ex an economist extraordinaire. Um, she's a social guarantee task force member, and she's obviously the author of the case for the Green New Deal. So over to you, Anne. Thank you so much, Maeve, and it's a great honour. It's really exciting to be part of this launch. And I'd like to thank you and, and Anna Coote and Ian Goff and my fellow trustees, fellow ta task force members for the support that's enabled this and the network for social change for the support that's enabled this to happen. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been very moved in the last few days hearing about children being asked to leave school uh, and to self-isolate because of the pandemic. I have grandchildren I and mean, I'm aware of, of the price that they paid during the pandemic to keep the rest of us safe. And now we're at this post pandemic, we're moving into the post pandemic phase. What are we doing for those children? What, are we, what foundation are we giving them so that they can be the future, that they can handle the future, our future? And I don't think we've given them a sound foundation. They want so much they need a, a decent educational provision and the government has been very reluctant about offering that provision, making up for all the lost time, making up for all the lost learning. They need to have their confidence built. They need, they need all kinds of services to help them. And it's absolutely fundamental that that provision should be something which is that we all build on because we all depend on this generation for the stability of our futures. So, you know, we've watched as their children have fallen through the net, so to speak, and not just children who've been forced to self-isolate, but poor children, poor children without access to the internet. I did homeschooling with my grandsons uh, over the pandemic and the internet would break down all the time, but at least we had the internet and at least they had little laptops to work from. We know that there were plenty of children that did not have this. And so we've got these great big holes in the provision of essential services that are foundational, not just for the children, but for the rest of us. Now I work in the sphere of monetary policy, monetary theory and policy. And I'm just very struck when I look around at how much collective provision there is, for example, for our, for our financial services, right? Our monetary system is a great public good, collectively supported, collectively underpinned. We have tremendous uh, public institutions, the criminal justice system, which enforces contracts, the regulated accountancy systems, the central bank, which is backed by taxpayers. These are all public institutions that underpin the monetary system, which is a great public good available and exploited mainly by the 1%. So we, you know, we are very keen on public provision and on collective provision when it suits the interests of the elites. And we're less keen when, it, when, it, when it's important for, for example, a whole generation of children that have made sacrifices through this pandemic to ensure that those of us who are older can survive the pandemic and to, who can help build the future. So I find this project absolutely fundamental to our futures, fundamental to a Green New Deal, fundamental to how we're going to build a generation that's going to help us cope with climate breakdown and uh, biodiversity collapse. That, 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 that generation has to be supported, it has to be trained, it has to be well fed, it, it has to be you know, encouraged and held up because they're so important to the future. So it's not, but it's not just young people. Of course, there are women who, are, who don't have a decent home, who haven't got a home for their children, who live in inadequate housing. They should be supported as a matter of right. Um, and then there's the elderly, of course, as well. So these are all services that actually are good for all of us if, we all, if, we, if they're provided on the basis of need and not a want. Our society, our economy is currently constructed on, uh, to serve our wants 
and our wants, as Ian Goff has so beautifully explained, can be exponential. They can rise exponentially. They can be, you know, uh, un <laughs> unlimited. Our needs are more basic. Our needs are more limited. And if the society is unable to, to provide its people, its citizens with basic needs, to fulfill their basic needs, that civilization will fail or will not, will not be able to tackle the very great threats that face us. So I'm terribly excited to be part of this project. I'm very proud of the work that's been done. And I, 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 want, I urge everyone who's listening to take up the social guarantee and talk about it everywhere and argue for it everywhere. And let's begin to change minds and change policies in order to achieve that, those kinds of foundations, those fundamental rights, those essential needs for so many of our own people. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that, Anya. That was a, I've never really thought of, yeah, the monetary system as a public good. Um, and yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, just on the sort of, I know that you've got a lot of experience in yeah, monetary policy. What, what are your thoughts on how we, how we fund, how we fund all this? So the point is this, that, um, you know, we have a monetary system that has been designed to enable us to do what we can do. And, and, and we've evolved it over centuries, you know. We set up the Bank of England in 1694 in order to provide us with the resources we needed to fight wars or the king to, to fight wars. And our monetary system is a social construct it's not a commodity. It's not. It's not made up of scarce resources. It's a. It's a thing that we have as people constructed, and we've constructed it in order to enable us to do what we can do. Now we can create money because money is nothing more than a promise to pay, um, and the way in which we fund our promises, because you know we met, we can all promise to pay, but will we be able to fulfil those promises? And of course, the public institutions I've been talking about underpin those promises and uphold those contracts. But the point is that once the way in which we pay for that is through employment. Um, and I know this sounds a little bit, uh, you know, sort of obvious, but we all know from our own experience that when you get a job and work for a month, at the end of the month, you get income. And at the end of the month, if you're on PAYE, you pay taxes to the government. Uh, or you go shopping or you spend that money on something or other and, and pay taxes on that. Um, and, it's, and, and so what we see is that government can invest in creating employment, for example, in creating jobs, jobs in schools, in education, jobs in housing, uh, jobs in clean water, all of those things that are absolutely essential. And those jobs generate income and income not just for the people involved, but also for the government which helps to pay for the initial investment. So that's what is going to happen as a result of the pandemic. You know, Mr. Sunak was able to issue all that money. He was able to issue, it's called QE and it's government spending. Um, and it is going to have to be paid for at some point. And the best way of paying for it is through full employment. And so, you know, the way in which we're gonna pay for all of this is to have full employment. When we have unemployment, when we have, um, uh, insecure employment, uh, precarious employment, our income falls, but so does the government's income fall. Tax revenues fall too. So the precariat, you know, are in that position is harmful to themselves, but it's also harm harmful to the government's budget. We mm -hmm. can't balance the budget uh, yeah. on precarious employment. So for me, the answer is full employment. And for me, a green economy has to be a labor intensive economy. We have to substitute fossil fuels. We have to substitute labor for fossil fuels. We have to get yeah. out of our motor cars and onto our bicycles. Absolutely. And, and then that's going to enable us to to generate more employment and that generates income and that can help to pay for the monetary stimulus in the first place. I Thank you so much. No, yeah, much. No, that's wonderful. And so I'm going to move on to our next panellist, who is Chaitanya Kumar. He is the Head of Environment and Green Transition at the New Economics Foundation. Um, and he's going to talk about the environmental benefits of the collective provision of services. So over to you, Chaitanya. Thanks a lot, Maeve. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, as may have said, my name is Chitanya. I work as a head of environment and green transition at the New Economics Foundation. 
Um, I've only been given five minutes. So what I've done to avoid me rambling for too long is just prepare some notes. So I'm just gonna read off of that, if that's okay. So you will see me sort of going left to right uh, on the screen, but hopefully it's, I'll contain it within five minutes because I have a lot to say. Um, firstly, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, those sort of speaking before me, uh, Anne, uh, and everything she's mentioned in terms of making the case for a social guarantee. I feel regardless of how and where the green transition fits into this agenda, uh, I must say at the outset that the case for a social guarantee was overwhelming before and is even more so now in a highly carbon constrained world that we've got today. Um, it is evident to us all that the climate emergency is here. Uh, we might not be responding to it uh, as such, but the signs are everywhere. I mean, take just you know, the Climate Change Committee's assessment of climate impacts on the UK, a report that they published a couple of weeks ago, which suggests there's a high degree of risk to public infrastructure, to habitats of terrestrial species, there's risk to food availability and safety, and to health and well-being across all nations uh, of, on the UK. A risk that are categorized as high today and set to get severe over the coming decades. And I think that's a serious concern for us all, of course. But of course, it's not all about doom and gloom either, because there is policy action. We are sort of picking up pace on that, but we all know that the pace, is, pace of change is too slow, particularly when we know that nothing less than dramatically transforming the way we travel, the way we eat, heat, and run our economies will do in meeting this emergency. So it is within this context that I want to situate the social guarantee and make the case for it. Uh, a context of significant uncertainty on the future, extreme weather, uh, and a broken economy that needs fixing. So as the head of environment uh, here at NEF, my work is at the intersection of environmental and social policy. It is increasingly obvious to me that the measures we take to cut carbon cannot be implemented without a strong social dimension not merely to ensure the costs and benefits of the transition are distributed fairly across society, which of course we should, but human well-being and flourishing is a much more profound objective in which natural environment and carbon play an underappreciated but vital role. Uh, the social guarantee to me therefore is an irresistible offer in achieving that higher objective while also addressing the climate crisis along the way. And I, I wanna identify three specific ways and I'll go through them fairly quickly. The first is in the design of the social guarantee and the microeconomic effects of it. Uh, a possibly seminal study, uh, which got released just yesterday, which was quite useful in me preparing these remarks, um, offered empirical evidence from a variety of countries to show how a greater provision of public services, so education, sanitation, health, etc., are likely to result in an overall low energy and ecological footprint. The report states, and I quote here, we find that the factors such as public service quality, income equality, democracy, and electricity access are associated with higher need satisfaction and lowered energy requirements. Conversely, extractivism and economic growth beyond moderate levels of affluence are associated with lower need satisfaction and greater energy requirements. Um, the authors are of course very careful not to claim causality, but their research I believe speaks directly to the value of universal basic services and income that can ultimately rationalize and lower society's carbon footprints, potentially to within certain you know, theoretical boundaries that the planet can sustainably hold. Now, similar studies have also shown the corollary, which is you know, where you compare two countries with high and low provision of public services, but with similar total consumption, the extent and share of high-end or luxury consumption would be lower in countries with better access to public services. Uh, and I think that's quite, quite an interesting insight. Uh, again, speaks volumes to the case uh, for a social guarantee. And as we all know, uh, limiting luxury consumption is extremely important when it comes to tackling climate change, particularly so in a world that we live today, where about the richest 10% are behind almost half of all the carbon emissions that we've seen since 1990. And that's, that says a lot. Um, the second and perhaps a more obvious way the social guarantee plays a valuable role is in what we refer to as a just transition. The net zero transition can risk leaving communities stranded, as we've seen far too often in Britain over the last four decades. Now, workers in communities that depend on oil and gas, steel, agriculture, automotive, and many other sectors will face turbulence. And as the government grapples sort of with this vague ambition of leveling up and net zero, I think its approach will either lead us to fail on either or both counts. And that's where a social guarantee, I would argue, is worth trialing here and avoiding repeating the scarring of our formal industrial heartlands. And the final thing, perhaps is a bit personal and speaks a bit to what Anne was talking about before me, 
And now much has been written about the notion of eco-anxiety, uh, particularly amongst the young. I'd say as a borderline young person myself, uh, this anxiety is real and manifests in the choices that I make personally with respect to my family, travel, food, and many others. There was a recent survey that I was reading that the FT had done showed, showing how young people in the UK and in many other parts of the world felt a deep sense of insecurity when it came to their income, career, housing, education, and generally having a comfortable life post-retirement or being able to think about retirement. Uh, I think to me, just to sort of conclude, uh, a social guarantee in many ways is, is essentially to tackle that increasing sense of insecurity that is widely prevalent and particularly so sort of in my generation. If done right, uh, it will relieve a whole generation of incumbent people to address the sense of immediate insecurity and begin charting a course through climate uncertainty. Uh, I'll conclude by simply repeating the first principle if you go on the Social Guarantee website, uh, which states that, I quote, access to life's necessities is an entitlement, not a concession or a privilege. I think it is this very simple yet wicked idea that we need to make common sense. Uh, and I'm very keen to work with Maeve and, and, and others to sort of make it happen. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Back to you, Maeve. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Titania. Yeah, I wanted to ask every all the panelists questions of my own, but in, in, in I can't remember what the word is, for time's sake. <laughs> I'm going to let I'm going to move on to the next panelist just so that the audience will have a chance to ask you questions. Um, so yes, without further ado, let me introduce you to Georgia Gould. Now she's the head of Camden Camden Council, and it's very exciting. Camden Council are actually trialing um, UBS at the minute, so it'll be really fascinating to hear. Yeah, to hear from you, Georgia. So yeah, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Maven. It's just wonderful to be here, and from from a local government perspective this campaign is just so needed. I think in local government we're, we're increasingly running a, a shadow welfare state which is filling in the gaps of a, of a failing and broken national system from council tax reduction to um, discretionary grants to the, the huge amount of resource we're, we're putting into addressing food poverty and just the, the basics of, of supporting our community and we saw, we saw during Covid many of us uh, delivering hundreds and thousands of of meals, but the, the it didn't start during COVID. We estimate in Camden, I think, ten thousand residents are in food poverty. So, so the need is experience. Uh, sorry, the need um, is extreme. And I think that what our residents tell us is their experience of interacting often with the benefit system and the welfare state is is it's rigid, it's dehumanising, it doesn't it doesn't pay attention to who they are or their aspirations, um, and uh, that it doesn't support them to overcome barriers. And we, we also see um, many people stuck in, in a cycle of in-work poverty. Before the pandemic, I think it was 63% of, of Londoners who were in poverty were, were in working households. So in Camden, we, uh, you know, we, despite austerity, we wanted to do, to do something to, to tackle these, these um, systemic inequalities we were seeing. And we thought that one of the ways we could make a real difference was, was employment support. So, so we uh, put aside five million to invest into supporting our residents into work. And we started off with, with people, with understanding where they were, I, either uh, some, sometimes far away from, from the labor market and, and not seeing any route through, or sometimes working uh, all hours um, and struggling to make ends meet. I think one of the worst moments for me as, uh, as a leader of a council was, was uh, uh, going to an overnight uh, homeless shelter and, and meeting people there who were coming uh, home from a full day's work to home to, to sleep on the floor of, of a church, so a real uh, failed system. So we wanted to support people who were in work poverty to, to progress. And I think that what came from that was that people wanted personalised support. They wanted some, a relationship with someone who understood you know, their, them, themselves as a whole person who would work with them on their own aspirations at their, at their pace. And we have an incredibly fragmented um, employment system. So we did the work as a council to, to bring together um, all the different training providers, job centre, everything that's in the borough over there. But, but we provided that, that, that individual to, to support the resident. Um, but what became clear from that work, that, that employment support wasn't enough um, and that there were, there were um, services that people needed to, to let them um, get started into, into work. So housing, uh, childcare, uh, access to the internet, transport, food, everything that, that you talked about, uh, Maeve, at the beginning. So we, so we decided to try and focus on a couple of those and to, 
uh, working with the Institute for Global Prosperity, who've just been amazing on a universal basic services trial. So we started out very small with just 10 people uh, around a transport uh, trial, which was as simple as giving people an Oyster card um, and, uh, and seeing how that changed things for them. And some of the, the um, responses we, we got back from that uh, were uh, just to, to put in the resident's voice. I, I really put into the extra effort to, to get to my training course. Um, I traveled without having to worry about it, eating into my depleted bank account. It allowed me to focus on natural application. So we, so we saw that that was a kind of powerful intervention, but, but it was just at the time the pandemic was starting. So, we, so when we decided to scale it, we actually focused on internet access because uh, we, in the kind of deep interviews and, and conversations we, we'd had with residents, we, we were hearing that that was a, a huge barrier. So again, some of the kind of stories we heard was uh, one resident um, who's Polish uh, said because she didn't have access to the internet, she couldn't help her children with their homework. She couldn't translate any of the words. A resident with ADHD, uh, said she could, didn't have any access at home but could only have half an hour at the library and just that wasn't enough time for her to settle in and, and to concentrate. Uh, somebody else said that they they could only access in an internet cafe um, and she do all her handwritten notes and then have to just transcribe that. It was really expensive um, and we, we had another re resident who was prioritising her children having, having access to the internet um, and she wasn't able to do her English uh, course um, in uh, as, as a result, because the children have to do so, so these kind of stories told us that the internet access was a huge barrier, and we saw that really deeply during the pandemic. So, we are currently um, in the midst of a hundred-person uh, trial where we are um, ensuring uh, uh, residents have a device, uh, a laptop, uh, Wi-Fi at home, and digital skills to allow them to to use those those devices. Um, and uh, people are referred through our, you know, anyone can access our good work offer. We don't have any eligibility requirements. They just have to be a Camden resident. Um, and then if that comes up as a, as a real barrier, then we're supporting them through that service. And it's, it's just started um, uh, a few months ago. So we don't have uh, the full evaluation, but it's going for a year. So, so hopefully um, uh, we'll have more for, to share as, as part of a campaign as, as, things, as things go forward. But we are already seeing that people are you know, able to do online interviews, to, to take online courses, that they're taking up the, the offer of increasing their digital skills um, and that we are seeing them able to access uh, opportunities that they never would have been able to do before. Um, and I think that I think the kind of power of the work, I hope the investment that we've made as a council, and we're by no means the only council doing this and we're working with Leeds and many other councils around the country is, is we're putting the investment in and, and we'll be able to say to government, or well, this is what ha can happen if you make this investment and, and hopefully um, once we, we start to see the results we can scale this uh, 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 on, a on a much bigger uh, basis because I, I feel there's green shoots of, of change happening uh, around uh, the country and, and one thing that really kind of brought it alive to me was something Henrietta who, who uh, runs IGP said, said to me which is the NHS is a, is a universal service but we don't treat everyone for, for a broken arm and people come in and they're treated for, for, for for, or they get support for what they need. And I think that the kind of services we're able to, to run locally are relational and they support people with the barriers that they might face. For some part, someone it might be childcare, for someone else it might be internet access, for someone else it's, it's access to, to transport. But, but through relationships, we can support people where they are. And, 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 um, and I think at a local level, develop a, a welfare state, which is human, which, is, which builds on social solidarity, um, and that is, is, is linked deeply into our communities. Oh, thank you so much. That was really inspirational. I, uh, yeah, I absolutely love that. Like we've got a proof of concept. We know that this works, like we can scale this up. It's yeah, very exciting. So thank you so much for that, Georgia. Um, again, I'm gonna move quickly on because of time. So let me introduce our last panelist who is the incredible Kay Rayworth. So Kay Rayworth is a radical economist and author of Donor Economics. And yeah, tell us about the social guarantee in the donor kit. Thanks. I'm really delighted to be here because I think this is a really, really important initiative that connects us actually back many, many generations back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? This has been a long story of recognizing the essential rights of all and the many different ways in which we can come to make that real. So I, I'm delighted to follow what Georgia just presented, which was so interesting, hearing the very specific details of bringing this alive in one count, you know, in Camden. I want to pull right back to the world and show the donut. Here it is. 
right? It's, it's one way of imagining human prosperity in the 21st century. If we think of humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle, the hole in the middle is where people are left falling short in the essentials of life. It's what we're talking about today. It's where people don't have the resources they need to have health, education, housing, transport, connection, care, community, leave no one in this hole. That has been the story of human rights since the beginning and we haven't done it yet, even in some of the world's richest countries like this one. But as we use Earth's resources to meet our needs, we must not overshoot this ecological ceiling. That's where we start putting so much pressure on Earth's life support systems. We push our planetary home out of balance and we cause climate breakdown. We destroy biodiversity. We destroy this one unique, delicately balanced living planet in the universe. So how do we do both of these at the same time? Because we are way, way out of balance. This is the whole of humanity, all of that red. This is the billions of people worldwide who are falling short in the essentials of life. Most of these people shown here are in the world's poorest countries, but we can all walk out the door in our cities or indeed in our towns and villages in the UK and find people living in serious extreme deprivation. And we're massively over planetary boundaries. So this is our generational challenge to turn this story around. And this, I believe, is absolutely what our children and their children will judge us for this. We at this point in this decade, this critical decade, and they will say, what did you do once that you knew, once that you saw that this is the challenge to take on? And it's really crucial just to, just to bring to mind the obvious, which is that last century's economic theories and governmental policies and business models and community ways of living were not designed to solve for this. They didn't see this. They didn't see this tension between meeting people's needs and living within planetary boundaries. So their way of living was not designed to solve for this. We need to come up with economic models and theories, with governmental policies, with business design, and with lifestyles of our own that are from our own generation's imagination and boldness and creativity to solve this. And we must do this in every country in the world because no country in the world is living in this donut and definitely not this one. So this is a time for innovation, for bold ideas to bring us back in this space. And what I love about the social guarantee is it's, it's exactly saying, let's take some big ideas, make them clear and compelling and simple so that everyone can understand it. A living income and universal basic services. This makes sense. And I know that one of the powers that the donut has in, in its irresistibility with people is that simplicity. And I think this is a really powerful and simple way that fits so well within it. Because of course, that social foundation of the donut is so close to what we're aiming to achieve here. And as Maeve said at the beginning, by focusing an economy on ensuring that everyone has the essentials, it draws us away from the extremes of inequality and the spending that takes us way into overshoot. I also really like the examples of experiment that Georgia was talking about just now. You know, we started with 10 people giving 10 people an Oyster card. Let's see what happens. We're giving 100 people internet connection to see what happens. And this experimental policy making makes sense because we know the economy is a complex system. We don't know exactly how people or the system or the ecology will react. So we learn by trying experimental policy design. Let's see. And let's amplify what works and let's pull back and do something else where it doesn't work. It makes so much sense to learn this way. And I just want, lastly want to say that what's been very exciting for me in sharing the Donut internationally is that in the last couple of years, several cities have come to us at Donut Economics Action Lab and said, we actually want to do this. We want to put this into practice in our city, starting with Amsterdam, Brussels, Nanaimo in Canada. We're now in a lot of conversation with places like Copenhagen, Toronto, Barcelona, and many others, Barbados, Curaçao, island nations that are saying, you know, as we pivot out of COVID, we're looking for a new vision. Now, many of them, when they come to the donut, some are first coming in because they know they need to live within planetary boundaries. So let me start with Amsterdam. Amsterdam was drawn to this because they said, we need to pull way back within planetary boundaries and we're gonna create a circular economy here. Amazing ambition. 50% circular material use by 2030. Every high income city and nation should have that level of ambition, by the way. They're gonna have no fossil fuel cars in the city by 2030, really on a vision for transforming, but they came at it from this coming back with an ecological ceiling. 
And more recently, that was a year ago, and more recently, the conversation within Amsterdam and the people contacting within Amsterdam, deputy mayors there, who were responsible not for the environmental story, but actually for the social story, for social equity, and ensuring the rights of all, saying, ah, we want to do both sides of this. So yes, we've got a low carbon transition. Yes, we've got a circularity strategy. But now we actually need to put that much more in touch with the inside. And to me, the social guarantee is that powerful framing that brings so much together that we already knew we needed to do in an irresistible way that everybody can understand, that can be interpreted and differently, put into practice differently in different places. That's key. Context matters, but the overall concept makes sense widely. So I know I'm going to be sharing the ideas of the social guarantee with many cities and nations that are drawn to the donut because we can talk about the ecological ceiling, but we deep need innovative policies that make sense and could be altered for local places to get us into this social foundation too. It's about balancing, thriving to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. So I'm just delighted to be part of this launch. I really believe this is big team work that we're involved in. I'm Donut Economics Action Lab together with New Economics Foundation, with Social Guarantee, with many, many others. Let's make sure our ideas connect and build on each other and support each other because this is how we make change happen. Oh, brilliant. Yes, <laughs> Mint, I'm glad you think that. That's exactly what we think. And yeah, it's a really exciting thing about the social guarantee and about all of this is it, you don't have to do it all at once. These things, yeah, we experiment and we try this here and we try that there and it can be incremental as well as radical. And it's just, yeah, wonderful to hear you saying that, Kate. Now, I've got a surprise for everyone. This is so exciting. It's like when, uh, when you go to a gig and then like, your favourite band, but suddenly the Beatles show up. So... We've got another guest, which is very exciting for us. So I would like to uh, make way for Professor Sir Michael Marmot. So he is the author of a number of groundbreaking reports um, about the extent and the causes of health inequality. And um, the latest being Build Back Fairer, which uh, came out yesterday, I believe, that was about the effects of COVID. And he's agreed to just give some thoughts, which is just phenomenal. So you're very, very welcome. And, and thank you so much for coming over, over to you. Well, thank you. I have to say I'm delighted with this whole framing. When I produced my February 2020 report, the Marmot Review 10 years on, and I said, as I've been saying for years, that health is a measure of how well we're doing as a society. What did I mean by that? How well the society is meeting the needs of its members, which is almost the same language that you're using. And what we saw, at the beginning before the pandemic was that life expectancy had stopped improving, inequalities in health were getting bigger, and life expectancy for the poorest people outside London was going down. And that means we weren't meeting people's basic needs. And in my 2010 report, the list I had is almost identical to yours, early child development, education, employment and working conditions, having enough money to live on, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. I didn't talk about internet access. That was, well, I didn't think of it. That's not because it's unimportant, it's vital. And we were commissioned, asked by Greater Manchester, to see how our Build Back Fairer report, which documented the fact that the pandemic had exposed and amplified these inequalities, how that Build Back Fairer approach could be applied in one area. And what Georgia Gould was saying about Camden, in a way, is what we were doing with colleagues in Greater Manchester. The, as got reported yesterday, the COVID mortality rate was 25% higher in GM than the English average. And the drop in life expectancy was 1.2 years for women and 1.6 years for men. The drop in life expectancy. That's what happens when you don't meet basic needs. So I think this social guarantee, we making common cause here. I wasn't using the language but I was saying the same things. And some of you will know that in my 2010 report, we, and again, it's consistent with what Georgia said, we coined the phrase proportionate universalism. We want universalist programs 
applicable to everybody because of the social gradient in health, but with effort proportionate to need. And again, I think that's entirely consistent with what you've been saying here. We've in recent reports, and we just did one for the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO, and before that one for the Americas, we said a great deal more about climate change and the climate emergency than I had in my earlier reports. But uh, I'm delighted with the idea of a social guarantee of taking this forward, because what we've said, there's been a failure of governance. And by that, I mean the failure of government to put equity of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. And the way to achieve equity of health and well-being is your social guarantee. Let's work together on this. Thank you so much. It was, yeah, an absolute boon to, to have you here. And yeah, I hope you'll stay and answer some of the questions from the audience. So yeah, I've got one to kick us off. Um, I'm old enough to remember when we had a welfare state. Isn't the social guarantee a return to the welfare state? What's the difference? And I think, Georgia, I'm going to give that one to you. Yeah, I think that the... the um... The welfare state was developed for its time and there was, you know, there's two basic universal services in there, um, education and the NHS, uh, which, which, you know, we see the benefits of, but it was designed for a time when women um, had a completely different role in society. We see whole aspects of, of the, the work we do, like social care and unpaid care is, were just completely missed out. So I think that that in many ways the, the challenges have, have changed. We, we have challenges of, of disconnection of, um, of, of people, um, as, as I said, being cut out of, of, the, of the labor market because of long-term health conditions. And I think we need a kind of new and, and modern welfare state that responds to, to those challenges. And I, the, uh, your childcare was never seen as a, the, you wouldn't need a universal basic service for for childcare because women were largely expected to do that so um you know and that would be one of the places that i would absolutely start and we see you know huge barriers for for particularly uh, women but for, for for men as well accessing um the labor market because of childcare. Uh, likewise you wouldn't have you wouldn't have needed digital access um in the past but again that's a that's a um a huge barrier but i think that underlying a lot of this is is poverty um and so when we talk about food poverty or uh, digital poverty or all the different kinds of, uh, of poverty we talk about actually we're just talking about people not having enough income to to meet their their basic needs um and i think that we that is something that has been a feature i think of austerity that we've seen the 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 amount that people have uh, chipped away at and what they do get is is subject to so many sanctions um so i think going back to a time where we're more generous in the way that we support the people and that we have more faith and trust in them because what we you know most people just want to to live a good life and and support their families and communities and i think we need to have a much more trust trusted and relational system but also one that is much more rooted in community um and place and again i think that the the centralized systems we we have at the moment just aren't working yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, I really think the situating it in place is just such an integral part of it. Like, obviously, creating a social guarantee in Birmingham is going to look completely different to creating a social guarantee in rural Durham. Like, it's 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 about thinking about the the place, the history of the place, the physical structure of the place, and how we can meet people's needs where they're at. That's um yeah, absolutely. So I've got another question, um, Michael. This one's for you. So shouldn't a healthy local environment, for example, parks and clean air, be on your list of universal basic services? We talk about healthy and sustainable places to, in which to live and work. Uh, we talk about that. And in fact, we show data that access to green space uh, not only improves mental health, but it actually reduces the inequality in deaths from cardiovascular disease. And access to green space follows the social gradient. The more deprived the area, of course, the less access to green space. So it's yet another source of inequality. And we highlight that. And we talked 
about environment in two ways. One, and it's very consistent with what Kate's been saying. We talk about it in two ways. One is the more immediate environment, which is social, physical, biological, but where you live and work. And the other way is climate, the climate crisis and the broader environmental questions. And access to green space is somewhere at the intersection of those. So it's absolutely vital and makes a contribution to inequalities in health. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also really essential for a healthy environment, right? So green spaces are carbon sinks. They're literally sucking carbon from, from the air and also porous earth takes flood water away. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a win-win for, for, for the health of the planet and the health of people. So absolutely. Um, right, I'm going to try and get to ask every, every panelist a question. Um, but yes, I'm very aware of time. So I'm going to ask you, Anne, what are the advantages of a social guarantee over a job guarantee or a universal basic income? Oh, that's... <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, Anne. Sorry, I unmuted. So that's a very big question. I mean, I, I think what we're talking about here, I, I was just to come back to your previous question as well. I, I think the term welfare state is a wrong one, actually. I mean, I, I think it was first used by beverage. And before that, we talked about social insurance. We talked about collectively working together to, to provide you know, uh, security across the board. And, we, and welfare state has the connotations of, you know, doing good, do gooding and of sort of handing down. And so, so I think we have to think about it differently. And that's why we're talking about a social guarantee. And the difference between a job guarantee and, a, and, and, and UBI is just that this is, these are universal services, whereas UBI sort of, in, in my view, imposes on the individual the burden of, of buying those services, gives them money with which to obtain the things that they need. What social guarantee does is to say, no, this is not a burden we were going to place on the individual. We're actually going to share collectively this effort and provide it collectively. So I think that for me is the big difference. And a job guarantee, I, I find I have difficulty with the term because I'm not sure that you can guarantee. I mean, you, you could guarantee everyone a job, but that would require the most extraordinary bureaucracy. Can you imagine chasing the last person and finding a job for that person? I, I, I worry about the bureau, bureaucracy of a job guarantee. I much prefer to think in terms of full employment that actually, and of thinking of substituting labor for, for fossil fuels, that we're actually going to have to grow. And the way I like to describe it is to say, we're gonna to have to learn to grow our own green beans instead of getting Kenyans to grow them and drain their water table, water table and then fly our green greens across the world for, uh, for 360 days of a year. So that, you know, our lifestyle are going to have to change quite dramatically. Thank you so much for that, Anne. Um, right, so hurrying on, Chaitanya, I've got a question for you. If acting to avert climate emergency is the top priority, how can the social guarantee be justified and how can it contribute? Um, it, it, it is at the heart of uh, the intersection between the two, i.e there is disruption that we're expecting both from you know, weather events, but also in terms of policy. Uh, and we are going to be introducing a lot of ambitious policy and we have to, there's no other option. Um, that, as I mentioned in, in my opening remarks, could potentially have a risk of standing communities um, across the country. And we've seen examples of that over the last few decades. I feel like the, in, in that space, in the, in the in the context of just transition or fair transition, as, as unions have popularized that term, I feel like a social guarantee fits in quite neatly. I don't think it's, if the question is coming from the context of how do we pay for it, then I think that is a, a secondary question, but I do not see any conflict between um, the need for tackling climate change and the policies that we have to introduce uh, to do so, um, and the social guarantee. I think in fact, both go hand in hand and hopefully I've laid out in my initial remarks that, uh, provision of public services will not lead necessarily to uh, universal provision of public services, not necessarily lead to a rise in carbon emissions because of a rise in energy or ecological footprint. In fact, the opposite seems to be the case as uh, 
you know, research seems to suggest. So I think both are certainly compatible. In fact, like I was trying to argue, you would need one uh, to get on cracking with the other. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I really like that. Um, it was my colleague Anna Coote who introduced me to it of that of the, of the social wage, and it was really interesting to think about what you said in your presentation about how when people have a, a large social wage, they're less likely to spend on luxury consumption, which is really interesting. And um, so the final question is for you, Kate, and I really like this question. And um, can you elaborate to what extent you think the social guarantee is compatible with our current political economic system and power structures? How would you say it relates to economic growth and overconsumption? So that's a big one. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> OK, well, we've inherited economies that are predicated on the idea that success is endless growth. And I can say that easily because you hear it in every political speech and you would experience it in every economics lecture. The idea that a growing economy tick, that's a healthy economy. Where actually in nature, nothing grows forever. Growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life for sure, but nothing aims to grow forever and things that do destroy themselves or the systems on which they depend. And the very purpose of this donut is to say the shape of progress is not an exponential growth curve, it is balanced. So we need to move to systems that actually create balance and actually so connected with the question that Chaitana was just answering. You know, people say, oh, tackling climate change, that's the that's the uh, critical emergency. So what we bring this one down. Uh, sorry, what, what about everything else? You think we're going to just solve that without tackling all this? I just want to say I, I was in Philadelphia at the end of 2019 introducing using the donut in the city of Philadelphia. This is a city with people suffering decades, even centuries of racial discrimination, deprivation, huge inequalities in society, lack of education, childcare, healthcare, access to jobs and transport. The idea that you could walk into a city and say, hey, everybody, we need to tackle climate change. I mean, just forget it because people will feel, oh, how, what, are you not recognizing the reality of my life? You need to tackle these things together. We need to show people that the policies and the options that are available to improve everybody's lives, whether I'm talking Philadelphia or indeed many, many cities and regions in the UK, that we can improve local people's lives to that guaranteed minimum level of decency and dignity and opportunity for all. And this is what it means to be part of tackling climate change. So these, these come together. And I just want to hark back to something that Anne was saying bringing ourselves back within planetary boundaries, moving to a low carbon economy, moving to a circular economy. It is an economy that requires people. It requires refurbishing and retrofitting and reusing and repurposing materials. It requires insulating 27 million homes in this country. So it, it precisely creates jobs, it creates local jobs and it creates purposeful jobs. So I completely agree with her that that, that desire to create living income and good and purposeful work goes together with coming back within those planetary boundaries. Is this possible within the political systems that we've got? Look, I remember uh, 15 years ago when I was working at Oxfam, the New Economics Foundation came and gave a, a lunchtime talk about, could we have a universal basic income? And I remember going along thinking, yeah, but really? I mean, that's never gonna happen. Well, these ideas, the idea of a living income, a guaranteed basic income, this is never coming real. Stockton, California, Finland, it's happening. These are trials. They become real when we try them out. And I want to go back to where Georgia was, right? Let's start with 10 people in an Oyster card. Let's start with 100 people in a laptop. Let's start with a town in California or a place in Finland. It is the cities, it is the districts that experiment, that, that model for the nation and therefore for the region and the, and the community of nations what's possible. And to me, this is how we change what is politically possible. So I'm so in, in giving all kudos to small places that start doing it and never say, well, we're so small, what can we do? You can model to the world. That's what we can do. And that's how we change what's politically normal. Excellent thing to end on. That was incredibly it was a call to action and very inspirational. Um, so we're over time. I have had the best time. I really just want to thank everyone. I really want to thank you all for being here and being part of this launch. It's such a dear thing to me and, and all of my colleagues have been working really hard to make this happen. And um, I really want to thank our panelists. And um, Michael's had to, to get off, so I'll, I'll thank him separately. But Kate Rayworth, Chaitanya Kumar, Ampere and Georgia Gold, it's been so 
inspiring and exciting to hear you talk and really grasp the concept of the social guarantee um, in, in the spirit that we intend it. Um, as I say, it's a collaborative effort. Um, so please do get in touch with us on our website and um, email us. We really want to hear from you. I really want to thank my colleague Anna Koo, who's made all this possible. First and foremost, she gave me a job and she's the absolute best. Um, and yeah, I've just had an excellent night. So thank you so much for coming. And yeah, I really hope to hear more from you in future and keep the social guarantee going. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Bye. Thanks.